What is going on, everybody? It's the Fonz, and we're here for AEW on TNT Review. Back on Wednesday night, the final episode inside Daily's Place until August. As they're going to be back on August 5th, I don't know why. Probably couldn't get a date for that day, so I said, you know what? We'll go back to Daily's Place. But for about a month, we'll be going other places. And hopefully after that, we'll be out of other places as well. But it is time to talk about the final show after 15 months. 15 months. You give us this show. And this show was great, except for one match and one finish. Now, we had Eddie Kingston and Pente Miedo versus the World Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks, with Brandon Cutler in a non-title match. And this match was Eddie Kingston beating the fucking shit beat out of him by the Young Bucks. And not taking no shit, just getting beat up. Just coming back at it, beat up, coming back at it. Penta got in there as well. Now, the Bucks came out by themselves. No Doc Gallows. And the reason, I'm uh, not Doc Gallows, I'm seeing no, um, uh, fuck. No Don Callis, who was not there at all tonight. Not even when Kenny Omega was in the ring later in the show for a promo segment, which we'll get into later. But we had Chris Jericho on commentary for the entirety of the show. And basically, that was because. The main event is Sammy Guevara versus MJF for the first time ever. Ever. Hell of a match. But that finish, we will talk about that when we get to it. But this was a banger. This was... If you're giving us an out with the bang type show, this is what you start with. The reason the Young Bucks are always, almost always, when they have a match in the opening match is because they want you... They, they want to, first off, they want to get their match done so they can go do the EVP rolls. Because, yes, after the matches are over, they, always, they go back and they do their EVP rolls. That's what they were doing here. So, and two, because they want to be the ones to like get the crowd hot for a damn good match. Now, this match was just going crazy. Of course, the Good Brothers eventually come out, and they, um, and then they try to get involved. They try to distract the distract the referee so Brandon Cutler could do the cold spray, but. Um, the cold spray gets sprayed into, I believe it was one of the bucks. It was, yeah, it was one of the bucks. I'm going to find out which one it was for a second. I, I, I came forgetting who was who. Oh, and into Matt's face. Cranky Kazarian then shows up out of nowhere, lays out, um, Cutler. Penta with a driver to the, um, dive to three people on the outside. Of course, that was Matt, or, yeah, Matt and the two, or Nick and the two, um, and the Good Brothers. Then hits the fear factor on Matt. Throws him into Kingston for the spinning back fist. One, two, three. Penta and Eddie Kingston are your new number one contenders. Now, yes, in WWE, we see this all the time where champions lose and they get pissed off because that's all that happens. Now, I can give AEW pass on this because it wasn't a clean victory at all. You had interference, which I'm getting sick and tired of interference with factions. And oh boy, again, we'll talk about that later. But the Bucks didn't went and lose this match clean. And they got they had taste of their own medicine. The Bucks, for the most part, have been part, have been winning all of their matches by shenanigans, nefarious means, cheating to the highest degree. And yeah. They get a taste of their own medicine, and it bites them in the ass. When they eventually lose the tag team titles, this is going to be something else that happens too. It's going to bite them in the ass. So, good on them. Penta and Eddie win. That match is actually going to happen next week at Road Rager, which I think it should be at Fighter Fest Night 1 or 2. Give it a couple weeks of promotion. But no, we're going to have it next week. So, there you go. We're going to 50-50 book more than likely because I don't see... Penta and Eddie getting the tag team titles. Those titles should be reserved for Pride and Powerful at Arthur Ashe Stadium. Just saying. Next week, I think they're going to do the double, the, the multiple headshots to like BT triggers to Penta, taking him out of action for a couple weeks to just have Eddie Kingston, like the, back, the back's against his corner, and it might be Eddie and Kaz going up against them next. Kaz also has a, an Elite Hunter t-shirt, so go check that out on AEWshop.com. He was wearing and rocking it. Backstage, we have Jungle Boy. 
um, Christian's talking to him and tells him he's proud of him, what he did, what, and, and that he took Kenny Omega to the brink. He believes Jungle Boy will be a champion Sunday and tells Jungle Boy to go out there and get his 50th win. The first man possibly to win 50 matches in AEW could be Jungle Boy tonight. Could have been on Saturday. That didn't happen, but could be tonight. Luchasaurus and Marco Stunt show up. The, Lucha, the Luchasaurus thanks Christian for having Jungle Boy's back in, while he was going. Going forward, he'll have Christian's back. Christian then jokes about having some dinosaur jeans in, on his mother's side. And we all know this is going. Christian's turning heel on Jungle Boy eventually. Maybe when Jungle Boy wins the TNT Championship. That's when you turn him heel. Not before, not after. That's when you turn Christian Cage heel. Why? Because then that gives Jungle Boy a worthy challenger for the TNT Championship. So, this, like, Jungle Boy is doing his thing, and he's going to get rack up wins. Christian's doing his thing, and the reason he's not turning here right now is because he's kind of dealing with the Hardy family office, who want to, well, Matt wants to end his career and send him back home to his family. So, you can't have Christian turn heel and still a few with the Hardy family office. So that's why for now, he's not turning heel. But I feel when Jungle Boy wins the TNT Championship, because that's why I think they're going with Jungle Boy, is he's going to be the one to topple Miro, and he's going to get the TNT Championship, and then it's either the night he wins the championship or the next night. The next, if it's on a pay-per-view, the next Wednesday, he's going to turn, he's going to congratulate him and turn on him. And that's where they're going to go with that. So, Tony Schiavone is in the middle of the ring with Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky. He brings up Page challenging Darby Allen in the coffin match and asks why this match. Page says that's what he's been he's been doing to Allen is not enough and his goal is to exterminate him and says he's trying to cripple Allen on the indies and AEW, but he clear, that's clearly not enough. They get the Page, um, Page's stupid chant or whatever. Page says every time Allen does a coffin drop going forward, he's going to think of Page. Every time you think of doing it, every time you want to do it, every time you do do it, you're going to be thinking of me. Lights go down, lights come back up. Sting is here. First time we've seen him in a couple weeks, which is good. Kept him off TV for a while. We didn't need to see Sting every single week. And we were kind of running on that quota of Sting over the quota. But Sting comes out. He's dragging a... Coffin, And if anybody thinks that a coffin and a casket are the same thing, they are not. They are not. A coffin and casket are two different things. A coffin is a wooden box with a, with a door, with a lid that you actually have to hammer in. A coffin, a casket is one of those things you see in most um, funeral homes that the door is latched on. Or connected to it. So, he's dragging a coffin... They play a video of Darby with a hollowed out coffin setting it on fire. Sting lifts up the um, sheet that was on it. Darby's in it. He runs over and starts beating up on Scorpio, on um, Ethan Page. Scorpio Shikai tries to get involved. Sting's having none of that. Hits the Scorpion death drop and Ethan and allows um, Darby Allen to just claw at the eyes. Of Ethan Page, who eventually, which Sting just sits there and watches and enjoys. Eventually, Ethan Page gets to the mat, gets to the floor and says, "No, no, I knew you couldn't beat me in hundred percent. So the match next week is off. Here's the deal: you want this match, I, I want this match, I want this match to happen. But I need you to put it in writing that you will not touch me the week before the match. And if you play nice, we might do this match at Fighter Fest. So the coffin match has been postponed." For at least one or two weeks, so no coffin match next week, even though next week's show is going to be huge. So we get to Jack Evans versus Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy, could he win 50 matches, be the first man to win 50 matches? I think that singles matches, or it's just matches overall. I mean, Jungle Boy has been wrestling a lot in AEW. I mean, I think he has the most matches in AEW history so far. But yeah, the dude, like, and here's the thing. I don't know if anybody knows this, but Jack Evans has been, has had a lot of heat backstage. I remember he had a match against, who was it? Uh, 10. Yeah, he had a match with 10 and that match. 
he 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 performed very poorly. I think he injured. Pat, I think he injured, or like yeah, he hurt or injured ten in that match, and that got a lot of heat backstage. Definitely not on a good run for this dude. So yeah, he's been taking a lot of losses. Jack Evans is he's been losing a lot, and if he's in a tag team match, he's and his team's losing, he's the one taking the fall. Of course, he was losing this match tonight. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about the fact that he was going to lose this match tonight. So, listen, it was a short match here. Jungle Boy is able to gain control of the match. He locks in the snare trap and taps out him for the 50th win. After the match, HFO tried to come out to do something, but eventually the Jurassic Express and Christian come out. They send... The Jurassic Express get everybody but Matt Hardy out of the way. Matt and Christian fight in the middle of the ring. Christian actually gets the upper hand. Jack Evans comes in to get Matt Hardy, allow Matt Hardy to get away. So, they're building up this match. It was not announced for next week, so I feel it's going to be at Fighter Fest. One in the next two weeks of Fighter Fest or the Fight for the... Is it Fight for the Fallen at the end of the next month? At the end of the month? Yeah, I think it's Fight for the Fallen. So, Christian versus Matt Hardy is happening soon. And that's going to be a match that they're going to want to have. And, of course, Christian's probably going to win. Because eventually, when Jungle Boy does eventually win the TNT Championship, which I'm predicting he's going to do by beating Miro, that's when Christian will turn heel. And him and Christian will have a feud over the TNT Championship. And all up there from there. Which will do nothing but benefit Jungle Boy. No, no doubt about it. So, we had some words from the main eventers tonight. MJF and Sammy Guevara. Smarted you, and I became the fox in the hen house known as the inner circle, only to create a faction of my own. I out-wrestled you, both at full gear and at blood and guts. I have outclassed you on the microphone week after week, and now I've dethroned you as the king of AEW, Christopher Jericho. You would think... As a 30-year veteran of this sport, you would know when to just call it quits, throw in the towel, and walk away when you have been bested by a man who's better than you. There's no shame in that, bud. But no, not you, Chris, not you. No, instead, you've decided to turn all elite wrestling into your own perverted version of Looney Tunes. You've attacked me and my friends in our locker room. You've doused us in bubbly. You have absolutely ruined my limousine, you have now decided to attack me during interviews? Interviews, Chris, really, this is... <laughs> you want to know why I'm laughing, Chris Jericho? I'm laughing because you think I'm the butt end of the joke, when in reality, Chris, you're the joke. You used to be so cool, man. You used to be a professional wrestling genius, and now this is the best stuff you could come up with, but it's sad. You stoop so low. So allow me to ask you a question, Chris. How low, exactly, are you willing to stoop? Well, I guess we're going to find that out next week, because next week I'm going to announce my stipulations to give you the ultimate opportunity that you've been begging me for, and that is one last match inside that squared circle with me. All I request, Chris, is that if you make it through my stipulations, which you won't, after I beat you, you will leave me alone for good. Now, in the meantime, in between time, I'm going to take out all your transgressions on that cute little protege of yours, Sammy Guevara. Sammy, you freaking hack. Hey, buddy. You know, a lot of people have been wanting to see this matchup for a long, long time. And it's because the wrestling fans around the world want to know, who is the future of professional wrestling? And Samuel, as much as it pains me to admit it, after tonight's main event is over, I think they're going to say that you're the future. Because I'm the now, and after I embarrass you live on TNT, I want you to go to your vlog and tell all the Sammy Simps that I'm better than you. And you know it. Just, what can you say? It's MJF. He is one of the best on the mic. you got Chris Jericho, Eddie Kingston, John Moxley, MJF as four, four of the absolute best. Kenny Omega's getting there. He's... His, his promo skills are improving. He's not the greatest talker, but he's up there. But, man, this guy is in his early 20s or mid-20s, and he's this good on the fucking mic. There's nothing but going up for this guy. Could you imagine MJF, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, 
going to WWE and having some lame-ass fucking WWE name, not allowed to cut his own goddamn promos, man, it would be just... It would be the worst thing in AEW, so... I mean, in all of wrestling, that they would stifle a guy like MJF. Alex Alphantes with Spencer um, with, uh, with Alain J. Ilido about his announcement, which I did not get to see this because, for whatever reason, my Sling app was acting up. He says he was ready last week, but Matt Sandel interrupted him. He says, how about me and Matt Sandel face off in the week uh, in the ring next week in Miami? So, Andrade El Idolo will make his in AEW in-ring debut next week against Matt Seidel. And they couldn't have picked a perfect opponent for his first match. I think that is going to be absolutely fantastic. Then, we get to Kenny Omega. And this was great. I missed this one too, except for like the end of it. I'm going to pull this a little bit forward because I don't want the copyrights on my channel. So, Kenny Omega in the middle of the ring, cutting a promo, interrupted by a certain faction that is friends with the number one contender in the rankings in AEW. So, anyway, <laughs> Kenny Omega looks like he's in the office. Try this again. Got the strap. You are still the man. Now, thank you so much, Tony. You know, this reminds me about a conversation that we had earlier in the day, a conversation where it was you yourself when you asked me, Kenny, for someone as decorated as you in professional wrestling, how do you stay motivated? How is it that you get up every day out of bed and find that next goal that you want to attack, to find that next plan? I, I didn't ask you anything today. Well, I will tell you, Tony, that today I woke up feeling like a king because it was upon further reflection that I realized not only had I defeated the toughest guy in AEW, not only had I defeated the greatest high flyer in AEW, not only had I defeated the greatest charismatic merch selling act in AEW. Not only had I defeated the greatest athlete not named Kenny Omega in AEW, I had also defeated the most promising up and coming star in AEW known as Jungle Boy and that was last week. So it pains me to say that unfortunately with no one left amongst the ranks in AEW that I'll have to take a little bit of chunk of time off. But hey, it's okay. I've still got belts with other promotions. You'll still be able to catch me all around the world defending championships somewhere. So my work here is far. Uh-oh. And yes, that is the order of music of the Dark Order, as Evil Uno and the rest come out. Kenny! Kenny! Please tell me to come. Evil Uno! Music. And the Dark Order with him! Did I hear you say that you have no challengers? <laughs> That's right. I said it. Well! Evil Uno thinks differently. You think differently, huh? <laughs> wait, wait, wait let, let me get this straight. Are you you going to send five after me now? <laughs> A guy like five? He wouldn't even last two minutes in the ring with me. He lasted ten about so a year ago. So why don't you and your little video game playing twerps turn around... I like the little quip from... Um... Chris Jericho back there. He back lasted about 10 last year, so keeping that in there. You don't hear that in other promotions. Walk back through that tunnel. You're not even close to being ranked to face me for the championship belt. You know, you're right. None of us have enough singles wins to go for the AEW World Championship, but I think you know someone who does. We sure do. I think 
you know someone that we have befriended, someone that you used to be very good friends with. The number one ranked single competitor in all elite wrestling. Listen to him chant that name. Hey. If you actually are talking about the same person that I think you're talking about, I don't think he would appreciate you speaking on behalf of him. Also, if you're talking about the same person that I think you're talking about, I don't think he has the guts to face Kenny Omega. If you're talking about the same person that I think you're talking about, that person doesn't even himself think that he has the right to hold up this belt and call himself a champion. So unless you've got something else to say, unless you've got some other trick up your sleeve, this is where I must bid you adieu. So Dark Order, this is where I say goodbye and good night. Bam. Yes. It's work. It's just so perfect with the, how they're doing this. You think, last year at All Out, Kane and Adam Page and Kenny Omega were the AEW World Tag Team Champions going in. They lost the tag team titles, and everything changed. Hangman and Kenny Omega wanted to go on his own. Hangman wanted to try and keep the tag team thing going. And honestly, since they lost the tag team titles, I don't think Hangman, except for what happened later in the night, like, Hangman has not uttered Kenny Omega's name. I don't think he's uttered his name at all, really. The others in the Dark Order have, but, and, of course, Alex Marvez has come in trying to get words with, with Hangman and Page, but he's never said the name, um, um, Hang Kenny Omega. Perfect. It's just perfect how they're doing this. Kenny, it's going to be Hangman and Page, Kenny Omega. The crowd in Chicago when this match has to happen there. Not at Road Rage, uh, not at Fighter Fest, not at um, Fight for the Fallen. This match is your main event of All Out. No if, ands, or buts about it. This is the match that everybody has been looking forward to for over a fucking year. Almost. We're going to be going about a, over a year because I believe um, All Out was September 1st last year. And this year is September 5th. So it's going to be a little over a year since they, the tag team titles were lost. And Kenny Omega just walked out on Hangman Adam Page. Beat him for the Eliminator Tournament. And it's where everybody, everybody's going to be loving it. When he hits that three, when he hits that, um, the, his finisher... And his finisher is and wins the AEW World Championship. That is going to send the Chicago crowd into a fucking frenzy. And I can't wait. It's it's not too far away either. It's like, well, it's going to be July here in a minute. About two months away. Two months away from Hangman Adam Page winning the AEW World Championship. That's gonna be great. When do they come face to face? That's between. That's how. That's up to them, and it should not be until later, like until August, somewhere time in August. They should not come face to face or even be in the same. Like Hangman shouldn't say his name, and Kenny shouldn't say Hangman's name until the time is right. This is just. This is perfect storytelling. This is what WWE is missing. This is what we love to see in professional fucking wrestling. This is great. And I can't wait to see what comes next. Earlier in the day we saw Brian Pillman Jr. talk about having friends with the, that were like family going up. And Griff Garrison is one of them. When Mira attacked Garrison, he showed that he's nothing but a bully and a big gaming bitch. Miro versus Brian Pillman Jr. AE, um, Jr. AEW TNT Championship. Now, can you can anyone be honestly say they thought that 
Brad Pelman Jr. stood a snowball's chance. A snowball's chance of winning the championship tonight. No. Not at all. But this match was basically give... Because basically what happened was we had the match. Brian's getting his ass kicked for the majority of the first... For the first section of this because it was a two-segment match. We had it go to picture in picture. Up until we came back from commercial, that was what happened is... Brian gets his ass kicked. We come back from commercial. Brian gets, an up, gets the upper hand for a bit. He gets to have his... He gets to go out there. He fires up. He gets a bunch of um, moves in. But in the end, kick a um, couple of roundhouse kicks. Mill with a leaping kick. He then amps up. Game over. Brian falls asleep. He, he pulls him into the game over. He falls backwards. And usually he just holds it there. But he actually put him in a sleeper. And Brian Pillman goes to sleep. So he beat him. And this is another thing you have to look at. He beat Brian Pillman Jr. But Brian Pillman Jr. did not tap out. That is a very small detail that I don't think many people are going to pick up on, but he did not tap out, and that is a smart way to do that. I I I much rather seeing a a person that that AEW or even WWE has something invested in if they're going to be in a match and they're going to lose. That if you're going up against somebody who has a submission a submission like Miro, especially the game over, have them pass out. Do not make them tap out. Have them pass out. It looks so much better. And it makes Ryan Pillman Jr. look tougher than all these other talent who are just sitting there tapping and tapping. Like, a guy, a, a Joe Schmo on Dark should be tapping out. But Ryan Pillman Jr. in a match should be hitting, should be passing out to Miro. So, I like the fact that they added that little detail. Good on them. Now... Dark Order Hangout is hanging out. Hangman comes in and he's like, what the hell was that? I didn't, what are you guys going to do? That you guys are going to make the challenge for me? Stu Grayson says, Paige didn't ex exactly stomp them. Paige wonders if the group thinks he's scared of this of, of him. Colt says, no, we're not, you're not, we're, we don't think that. But Colt, Colt says this and it's true. He thinks you might be afraid of failure. The guys all hype up Paige and heads out. Basically, if you think about it, the very first, um, all out, very first world title match, Chris Jericho versus Hangman Adam Page. Hangman lost. Hangman, of course, at that time was not ready to be world heavyweight champion. It would have been the biggest mistake for AEW to give him the world heavyweight championship, even though they probably wouldn't add the steakhouse incident with Hangman, but who knows. Hidden... Him, didn't he take the pinfall in the match against the women, against the tag team champ for the tag team titles against FTR, right? I'm pretty sure he took the, took the pinfall against FTR. Then there was the Eliminator Tournament. Hangman Adam Page lost the Eliminator Tournament to Kenny Omega. Big, 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 like he's won pay-per-view matches, I mean, come on. But big pay-per-view matches. He has failed, and he has failed, and he has failed. So he's afraid, and, and, and Colt brings it up. He could be afraid of failure, and that's why he doesn't want to talk about Kenny Omega or the World Heavyweight Championship. The, and John Silver's like, dude, you, like, everyone was like, when I had my championship opportunity for the TNT title, you held me on your, on your shoulders and hyped me up. John Silver's like, dude, you said that you'll always be there for us and help us out, and we want to let you know we're going to do, we're here for you too. And Alex Reynolds like, dude, it's your time. We believe in you. They walk out as Paige waited, and they, that he's waited long enough, and his time is now. As he just watches them leave, and he has his time to think. Then we go to the backstage area and a different area, and Taz with the powerhouse Hobbs and Hook. He says Stark and Cage aren't here, and they have a rough relationship. Says it's been rough on the whole group. Hook says he's had a he's tired of it. Hobbs is like, you know what? They need to figure. Someone needs to figure this stuff out quick. Taz is like, you know what? This is what's going to happen on July 14th. It'll be Brian Cage defending the FTW Championship against Ricky Starks. Sometimes family fight and they'll hopefully figure things out. Taz notes Stark will be medically cleared by then. And that is the day Brian Cage is out of Team Taz. It's coming. It's been a long time coming. Everyone sees it coming. Everyone knows it's coming. Brian Cage 
Starks' time with the FT with the FTW title is over. Ricky Starks will beat him for it thanks to Hobbs and Hook. And Brian Cage is going to be off on his own, feuding with these guys probably for the next few months. Then we go to the disaster of the week. Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero versus the faker, the delusional, moronic, dumbass, Britt Faker, and Rebel. Which, condolences to, um, to Rebel. I don't know what happened, but she got injured in this match somehow. She, I think she might have tore a quad because she was trying to break up a pin. After Rose did the top rope off the um, knee, off the top rope to the faker. She goes to pin her. Rebel breaks it up, but she hurt herself in the end. And it looked like... Um, I saw the... I, I, I didn't even really... They didn't mention anything on TV. But you look at where it happened, and you could just see that maybe something went wrong with her leg. Someone put a video up that they took of, doc, of the medical staff helping her back to the... Back to the back. So... There, that's another injury that goes down. AEW picking up those injuries all the time, but it's the nature of the game. Everybody has a chance to get injured. Nobody, nobody is immune from injuries. So Vicky gets tagged in. Rose is feeling confident, decides to tag in Vicky to finish things off, and the faker ends up putting the lockjaw on her, and she taps out a bunch of garbage. This was, This is your women's world champion. You know what pisses me off the most about the Faker being champion is the fact that she's been seen more on TV as champion than Riho, Nala Rose, and Sheeta has in the same amount of time. It's pathetic. She's been on TV in backstage interview segments and this match every single week since she's won the championship. How often could you tell that could you count in the first month of Riho, Sheeta, or Nala Rose's championship reign were they on TV? Very Fucking rarely. But yet, the faker is on TV every single goddamn week. It's pathetic. This woman is terrible. She couldn't even do the knees to the back move right. She tried to do a super kick, fell on her ass. This was bad. This was a fucking disaster from the minute that Guerrero was in the ring and Rebel shoves her. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You couldn't get anybody have a, as a swerve to make it a match that people can actually probably give a shit about. Yes, it sucks that Rebel got injured. I hope she's reco fully recovers from whatever it was. That, like, she was not able to walk at all when people were taken to the back. So, that's going to be bad. So, I feel bad for I feel bad for Rebel. I don't want to see anybody get injured. But, eh, it, it is what it is. What can you do? Injuries happen. Anybody can sit there and blame whoever this look. This this definitely looked like a non-contact injury. Those are like those are the ones that suck the most because you're doing everything right that you can, and just boom, something happens. It's usually a, it's always a leg injury when it's a non-contact injury. Most of the time, unless you go down face like hand first or something. But yeah, another injury. Someone had that list up, and I don't know what happened to it, but it's like, yeah. The list of injuries this year in AEW is astounding how many people have been injured. Just, wow. So, after the match, Rose gets back in the ring, beast bombs her, then rolls her over to the apron, and there's a table on the floor that she set up during the break. Power bombs her through her, and that is that. Next week, Coop T. Marshall versus Cody Rhodes, South Beach Strap Match, which, by the way, we had a, they had a coffin match on here, too. You didn't need the coffin match. The strap match is the big, um, should be the stipulation match for the week. You don't need more than one stipulation match on TV. I don't care if it's a special event or not. MJF to announce the stipulations against Chris Jarrett to get through. Will there be some slashings like when Cody got the stipulations? If, the mat, if they have the match and Jericho loses, he has to leave MJ alone forever, which tells you Jericho's probably going to win. Andrade El Idolo versus Matt Stiedel, the Young Bucks versus Pentel Zio Miyoto and Teddy Kingston for the World Tag Titles. Jake Hago Santana Ortiz with Conan versus Wardlow, FTO, Tully Blanchard. I'm sorry, Wardlow and FTO with Tully Blanchard. And for the first time since the Jericho Cruise, and the first time officially on AEW television, there is going to be a mixed tag team match as Chris Statlander. And Orange Cassidy take on the Bunny and the Blade. The last time there was a mixed tag team match, it was on the Jericho Cruise. It was with poor, poor lighting, poor camera work because all the main cameras were taken down already. 
Chris, it was um, Riho and Kenny Omega versus Penelope Ford and Kip Sabian, and there was intergender wrestling. Will that happen here? Maybe. We'll have to wait and see. Which, Chris Statler has wrestled men before, so it wouldn't surprise me. Jake Hager and Santana Ortiz uh, hype up the next six man's tag match. Hager says almost respect, he almost respected World Love when they came into his world of MMA, but MJF ruined that and he punched Dean Malenko, which he got very pissed off about. Santana says they're kicking FTR's ass next week, and if they don't, if the dog Tully is in the corner, they're bringing their own Conan. Last week, the Brave used brass knuckles to lay out Quince Cassie after the Bunny versus Chris Statlander, and next, of course, we got the match next week. And then we go to the main event. Now, this was fucking awesome until the last two minutes. They got 30 minutes. They got the they, they got the whole 20 minutes time limit almost. This match could have easily Easily went to a draw, and I don't think anybody would have thought otherwise. There was a fucking tombstone off the top rope, which my dad was losing his mind about because he did, uh, what is it? That the, he did one of those e feds back when back in the day, back in like 15 years ago when that was a popular thing, and he had a character who did a power driver off the top rope. And he was losing his mind because it, it's like AW stealing his shit from back in the day, but yeah. This was a fucking great match. There was a spot where Sammy Guevara had thrown MJ, got MJF thrown over the barricade. So he decides to do a leap and a, a, a thing off the top rope, a senton off the top rope to the outside. Crazy ass shit. But then the fucking finish had to happen this way. They're having this fantastic barn burner of a match. Match of the year. Probably. Not one, it was the contender in match of the year. But I will never, ever, ever consider a match of the year with this shitty ass finish. Sean Spears comes down, slowly, and Chris Jericho's like, I'm not going to let this shit happen. He goes to run over there. So, Warlow attacks him from behind. Warlow grabs Jericho and, tells, and yells at the referee, wants the referee's attention. For whatever reason, gets the referee's attention. Jericho gets thrown off the barricade, off, off the stage, to the outside, and then... For whatever fucking reason, the referee is checking on Chris Jericho, who's not even in the match. Ugh. This allows Sean Spears to hit Sammy Guevara over the head. MJF barely gets up, pins him one, two, three, and wins. In the lamest lame duck finish they could possibly come up with. This was the best you could fucking do for the end of the, like this match. Was to end it like that. MJF wins. Fine. Use the dynamite diamond. Ring. I don't care. Don't do this type of finish. This was terrible. Send the fans home happy with this. I mean, yes, they did a nice three and three and a half minute package after this match to thank everybody in Jacksonville. Show us all these great moments. If you watch it, there was a lot of moments in the last 15 months that a lot of them you probably couldn't do in front of a live crowd. But hey, whatever. Great show, except for the Nyla Rose match, until the end of this match. This was just piss poor bad. And this is a track record happening in AEW. I am so sick and fucking tired of interference in matches that have, have to do with factions. You know what was great about Jungle Boy vs. Jack Evans? There was no interference from HFO until after the match. Yes, there was a possible interference with the Good Brothers, with, Matt Hart, with um, Young Bucks, but that got neutralized. This didn't need to fucking happen this way. This was dumb. But that is your AEW review. Definitely a hell of a show, but that finish in the fan event is going to be what people are going to talk about. I hate this shit so much that it's like, you have a great match. I want to talk about the, like a great match from start to finish. I don't want to have to watch a great match and then you get fucking ruined because somebody doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. Tony needs to get his head out of his ass and think, stop doing these goddamn interferences because they happen way too fucking much. And the problem with having interference in matches that don't need interference, when you want to do it in a match that it makes sense, it doesn't have the same fucking impact as it would if you did it once in a blue moon or once in a show. But the fact that they're doing it once, twice, three times a show most of the time, if you have a match that the interference actually makes fucking sense... It doesn't have the same effect, and it, it ruins the match. So, that is your AEW on TNT Review. Next week, they are back on the road in Miami, and then they're going to be moving to Texas for the remainder of the month, if I'm correct. 
I think, oh, no, two of, the, two of the episodes. But hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Minds at the France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash the France Club. And find me on Instagram at the France Club. And I will see you guys Friday for SmackDown. Until then, my name is the France, and I'll see you guys later.